Whenever we talk about faith, faith is not a natural life force. It's not something you're born with or it's not something that you're born into. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And without faith it is impossible to please God. Peter in his first letter tells us that the new birth is from the seed of God's word. We're told in St. John's Gospel that the Word became flesh. And Jesus himself says, you must be born from above. In other words, you must have a spiritual rebirth. There are two words that describe the Word of God. One is Logos and the other is Rhema. Jesus became Logos. We will never be Logos because we can become the Rhema of God which is his word incarnate in us. In other words, I have to become a living rhema. God's word has to become an incarnate part of me. And just because you confess the word of God, it doesn't give you the power. It has to become a living part of you. It has to be grafted into you in the same way that the vine and the branches are all one. And when the branches are all one with the vine, then it can produce the fruit, which is the grape. And the branch draws all its life from the vine. So the word of God has to be planted in the good soil of my heart, not in my head. Because only then will it bring forth the fruit and reproduce what it should be reproducing in my life. Now James in his letter in chapter 5 and verse 15 speaks of the prayer of faith. It means that the word of God that I speak with my mouth has to bear witness with what I believe in my heart. There has to be an agreement because faith is in the heart. It's not in the mouth. You don't speak the word to get faith. You speak the word that has become a part of you. In other words, what I say is my faith speaking. In Proverbs 4 and verse 20 we're told, My son, pay attention to my words. Listen carefully to the words I say. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them deep in your heart. They are life to those who grasp them, health to the entire body. So keep them into your heart, not keep them into your head. Just confessing the word won't work. Many people confess the word and nothing happens. Rhema is not what I speak, it is what I am. The ingrafted word becomes one with my heart, and then when I speak that word, it becomes the word of faith. An example of this would be from Paul in Acts 14, where he healed a man who was crippled. We're told that a man sat there who had never walked in his life, because his feet were crippled from birth. As he listened to Paul preaching, he managed to catch sight of his eye. Seeing that the man had the faith to be cured, Paul said in a loud voice, Get to your feet, stand up. And the cripple jumped up and began to walk. There he was acting on the word that he had received. That is faith. Faith is a fact, but faith is an act. You've got the opposite of this in Acts 19, where you had the seven sons of Sceva, who tried pronouncing the name of Jesus over people who were possessed by evil spirits. They used to say, I command you by the Jesus whose spokesman is Paul. And the evil spirit speaking back says, Jesus, I recognize. I know who Paul is. Who are you? And this evil spirit within the man rose up, overpowered all seven of them, and they fled from that house, badly beaten and naked. Back in the late 80s, whenever I lived in Straban, I was invited to go to Coleraine and do a music ministry course. And one of those days when I arrived there on a Saturday morning, uh, Andrew Rogers, who was taking the courses at the time, opened the front door and we all going up behind him up the staircase 
Um, he got to the door up above wherever the meeting was and there was no key to get in. He had to go back down again and he says, I'll be back in about five or ten minutes. Someone else had a different key for it. And I'm standing down there at the bottom with my guitar in my hand and it was as if the Spirit of the Lord just rose up within me. I says, we've been given the name that is above every other name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow on heaven and earth and unto the earth. I says, Locke is only a name. In the name of Jesus Christ, Locke, you bow your knee. And I'm running up the stairs. In the name of Jesus, you bow your knee. I command you to be opened in Jesus' name. And this woman, Evelyn, who was standing right beside the door, says, Yes, that's right, we should have the faith to do so. And she put her hand on the lock and fell in through the door. <laughs> so, that's what I mean. This also happened when I was over in Gateshead. After Kieran had died, uh, they hadn't got any keys to get into the car to move it out of the garage so they could get hold of the, the lawnmower to cut the grass outside. And I got a phone call to say, could I come over to see if we could get this thing moved? Well, there wasn't a key about the place, so I just said the exact same thing as again to Joe, who was there. I come coming down the stairs with Joe, I says, Look, Jesus is the name above every other name. Lock is only a name. In the name of Jesus, we command it to be opened. We walk out to the garage, I pulled the door, and the door flew open. So, these things work. Because Jesus says, If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. The truth is that the seed of faith has all the potential in it. But it has to be planted in good soil. Jesus never intended us to remain just with a little bit of faith. It must grow. It must develop. Now in the Song of Songs in chapter 6 and in verse 6, there is a saying there that says, Your teeth are like a flock of sheep as they come up from the washing. Each one has its twin, not one unpaired with another. Now, if a sheep has got one long tooth, it will not be able to masticate its food, it will starve to death. In other words, if we are not able to rightly divide the word of truth, we will die spiritually. We need to know how to break open the word of God, so that we can digest it, otherwise we will starve to death spiritually. Peter gives us some good advice in his second letter where he says you will be right to depend on prophecy and take it as a lamp for lighting a way in a dark place until the dawn comes and the morning star rises in your minds. In other words if you've got the word of God before you and you've no understanding of what it's saying to you keep it before your mind ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you and in due course it will rise like the morning star and you'll get the revelation of it. You will never understand the word of God unless you have the Holy Spirit teach you. In his first letter to the Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells us that the natural man cannot understand the word of God. Jesus couldn't use any of the rabbis, even though they knew all the scriptures from beginning to end. They had all the understanding in their heads but they had no heart knowledge. Head knowledge and education will never give you the revelation that you need because only the Holy Spirit can reveal Christ to you. In the early church, they were first called believers, but it wasn't until Antioch that they were first called Christians. And I believe the reason for this is that A Christian is someone who is Christ-like in behaviour, in character, in conversation, and in nature. So believing is the starting point. But the Lord wants each and every one of us to mature, to become Christ-like. And it's only then that we can call ourselves Christian. The basic teachings that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 6, They do not demand me to be obedient to the word of God. In other words, I could stand up every Sunday and make a profession of faith, like I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, etc. But even the devils believe in God. 
In other words, all I have to do is to agree and make acceptance of the truth. This is just mental agreement. But the doctrines of righteousness mean that I have to be obedient to the word of God. This is what transforms and cleanses my soul. When I receive the word, I have to obey it. James in chapter 1 says, anyone who hears this word and doesn't act upon it. It's like looking at yourself in a mirror, going off and forgetting what you look like. And in Matthew 7, Jesus would put it like this. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on rock. Rain came down, floods rose, gales blew, hurled themselves against that house. It didn't fall. It was founded on rock. But everyone who listens to these words of mine does not act on them will be like a stupid man who built his house on sand. Rain came, floods rose, gales blew, struck the house, it fell, and what a fall it had. Now, the rain beating upon the roof, that tests the head of the house. Man has the authority within the home. And the attack on the family and on the church in this generation has primarily not been an attack on women or children. It has been an attack on men. Because if seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, can morally eviscerate or spiritually emasculate the man, they can decimate the family. And whether the attack is from the hedonists, the feminists or the gay lobby, the more man is diminished in stature, the greater Jesus is diminished in his manhood. This is primarily an attack on Christ. Then you've got the wind beating upon the house. This tests the structure of the home. The perimeter walls and the interior walls are all bonded together to make one solid unit. And the effectiveness of the family structure is dependent on how well we communicate, interact and are bonded with each other. So when the winds of the vision blow, a house divided against itself will fall. So what we're seeing today with the breakdown of family life is an attack on the body of Christ. Then you have the flood. Well, this tests the foundation of the house. And Paul says that there is only one foundation that we can build on, and that is on Christ. When we in the church only try to get people involved in doing things in the church, instead of getting them identified with Christ, then it's like building a second story over a vacant lot. In other words, no foundation and everything will fall. Jesus says we were to make his word our home. We would know the truth, it would set us free. And he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask what you will and you shall get it. See, faith is only the door to all the other gifts. And we have to add on to our faith. We have to add goodness. We have to add understanding, add patience, add self-control, add true devotion, add kindness. And then to all of these, add love. So faith is only the starting point. And whenever we talk about faith, in Leviticus 19.19 19, we're told not to sow two kinds of seed together, or not to mix two types of material together. In other words, you don't sow mixed seed because there are things in our life we have to remove that will contaminate our faith. James would put it like this. If we need wisdom, just ask God for it and he will give it to us. But he says you must ask with faith, with no trace of doubt. Because the person who has doubts is like the waves thrown up in the sea and the wind drives. And that sort of person in two minds wavering between going different ways 
must expect that he will receive nothing from the Lord. So if you've got doubt, it will nullify your faith. If you've got anxiety, it will nullify your faith as well. You see, in Luke 16, 16, we're told that up to the time of John, it was the law and the prophets. Since then, the kingdom of God has been preached. And in Matthew 4.23, Jesus went around proclaiming the kingdom of God. So John and Jesus came to introduce a new covenant. See, the old covenant could only cleanse the flesh of man on the outside. It couldn't change the nature of people with inside. And what is the kingdom of God? According to Romans 14.18, it is righteousness, it's joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. And where is it? According to Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within. And Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else we need in life will be added on to that. And Jesus taught about the kingdom, and everyone got healed. Nobody was in want of anything. And the apostles for three and a half years were taught the principles of the kingdom of God under the ministry of Jesus. And in the Acts of the Apostles, all these people came under the apostolic teaching and they carried on everything that Jesus did. So how do you establish the kingdom of God within? Well, in Matthew 13, we're given the principle of the parable of the sower. And I have to learn how to take that word and make sure that nothing robs my heart of the indwelling power of the word of God within me. Because you've got the seed that fell on the edge of the path. That was received by those who had the word of God stolen out of their heart because they had no understanding. See, the natural man cannot understand the word of God. It's all nonsense to him, according to 1 Corinthians 2. And then we're told in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 3 that the written letters bring death, but it is the Spirit that brings life. Unless I have the Holy Spirit within me, this word is a dead word. See, the seed on the rocky places, they received the word of God with joy, but they didn't have any character to make sure that the word was established and put it into operation so that when the trials came there wasn't enough root of stability of character to walk through the trial without either getting depressed or worried. And you see, the kingdom of God is not just what you say with your mouth. The kingdom of God is establishing the very nature of Christ within us. When God looks at us, he sees the nature and the image of his Son in us. Now, the word itself means nothing until you put faith to it. Then that word becomes a living word. Then it becomes spirit. And then it becomes life. And that's what Jesus says, the words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. You see, I can memorize, if I want to, every word that is in this book. I may be able to quote it from beginning to end. But if the Holy Spirit is not revealing it to me, or I don't have the faith to turn that word into Spirit, then it is nothing but just a good book. In Jeremiah 4 and verse don't sow your seed among thorns. If you have cares and anxiety in your life, you're going to nullify the word of life. And we are living in an anxiety generation. And according to Luke 21, all these things are going to increase. And today we've got millions of people turning to medication 
and the Greek for that is pharmakia, which is sorcery and drugs, according to the word of God. And from Matthew 13 to Matthew 18, Jesus taught the principles of the kingdom of God. And what the Lord wants to do is, he wants to establish his character, his nature within us. And it's no longer what I do, it is who I am. And you cannot establish character by works. How did all these unlearned, uneducated men turn the whole world upside down? See, apart from St. Paul, not one of them had any theological qualifications. Yet Jesus says, we are the salt of the earth. Now, if you come to that place where you develop the nature of Jesus within you, in Romans eight seventeen it says, If we suffer with Christ, we will share his glory. Now, the word suffer here means to be tempted. And we're told that Jesus learnt obedience through what he suffered. And he was tempted. And James tells us that we are to treat all these trials, all these temptations, as friends, not as enemies. Because trials and temptations are only used by God to develop the character within us. If we don't go through all those trials, we will never develop the character of Jesus within us. The seed is in there. It just has to be watered. It just has to be developed. And the kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed. It has to grow. So instead of complaining about all our troubles, we are told to give thanks. So are you treating your trials? Are you treating your temptations with joy? Because if you're not being tempted, or if you're not being tried, then get worried. In the midst of all these trials and temptations, are you murmuring, or are you complaining about them? Because if you do, what you've done is you've opened the door for the enemy to come in and rob you, and take away even that what you thought you had, the advice that we're given from Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians is this you must never complain as some of them did and they were killed by the destroyer and all this happened to them as a warning and it was written down to be a lesson for us who are living at the end of the age the man who thinks he is safe must be careful that he does not fall. The trials that you have had to bear are no more than people normally have and you can trust God not to let you to be tried beyond your strength and with any trial he will give you a way out of it and the strength to bear it. So now you can understand why most of us don't have any power. Our trials and temptations, if we respond in the right way, will develop the nature of Christ within us. And we have two choices, to respond either in a relative way or to respond in an absolute way. Now, the world responds in a relative way through feelings and emotions. But an absolute response is made according to what the Word of God says. And every time that I resist that temptation, every time I overcome that trial, I am crowned with the crown of life and I am establishing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we pray for every time we say the Our Father. I do not have to wait to get into heaven for the kingdom of God to come because the kingdom of God has come into me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son 
to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.